Hi, everyone. My name is Fahad Sada. I am a neurologist in upstate New York. I am the pro, uh, stroke program director at one facility in Syracuse, and I am the uh, neurophysiology director at another facility approximately an, an hour away from the upstate area. I look forward and I'm so excited to tell you about my experience because I really think my experience is um, identical and as, as exhausting as well as there is some compassion and role in getting everyone more enthusiastic and looking forward to completing this education and being successful. I uh, graduated from St. Matthews University uh, in 2011. I chose St. Matthews as my uh, medical school because I had many family members that went to that school and became extremely successful physicians. I took their path and uh, their, I, they were my mentors in this whole entire process. Uh, and I would like to um, communicate and share with you my experience in how I started school, went to residency, went to fellowship, and became a neurologist all in a very early age. I attended undergrad uh, um, college uh, pretty much in the US in Chicago, and I completed my 90 credits uh, that's required to apply to the Caribbean school. So didn't take any summers off, went straight from high school to completing those 90 credits within two and a half years. Following that, I completed my undergrad education online and received a BBA during my medical school uh, education. So I applied to St. Um, Matthews University, believe it or not, only school that I applied to. I got accepted. I started December, uh, sorry, January of 2008. I graduated May of 2011. So if you look at that period, it only really took me three years and four months to complete my medical school um, education, which was a huge success, which was great. It looked good on paper. And I was able to use that to my advantage in the sense that when I was interviewing, I was able to communicate and say, this is what I got done. This is how fast I got it done because of my hard work and dedication. I did it at an age of, I started medical school probably uh, early 20, actually I turned 21 in the Caribbeans, I remember. Um, so I was 24 years old writing prescriptions for physicians. So this is, uh, this is how exciting that was. Um, I was an internal medicine prelim resident writing prescriptions. So I'm gonna tell you about that path here. It all started with completing your medical education. That's the most important thing. Get it done and excel in it. Learn as much as you can. But the most important step here is, and this is in particular important for current international medical grads that are, or international medical students that are currently either outside the country, in the Caribbeans. It's critical to get your step one completed and do very well in it. I'm not saying if you need to take it again, it's, it's going to be uh, the end of the world, but it's really, really important to pass it and get rid of it and move on. Because as soon as you have that step, the doors just open. The doors in rotations, uh, shadowing, everything else opens because unfortunately people look at that. They, they Before looking at the resume, before looking at other um, uh, community services or other experiences, they really look at your step scores. So I was able to complete my step one immediately after my uh, two years of medical school. And I started my rotation immediately. I had my child, my first child at age 22. She used to live with me in an extended stay hotel while I was doing my clinical rotation. That's how, you know, the dedication I don't want to never slow down. Actually, she was born hours, three hours before I had to get in a car, drive from Chicago and go to Baltimore to start my internal medicine rotation. 
And unfortunately, I will never remember, I will never forget this, actually, you can't forget this, because my wife, you know, had some complications, had to stay in the hospital for five days, and I was all the way in Baltimore, and she was in Chicago. But it just had to get, we had to go through it, it had to be done. So uh, with that said, we did not take any breaks in between my clinical rotations. And I was able to complete my step two CS and CK while I was doing my clinical rotations. I just took a lighter rotation to be able to study. I became interested in uh, neurology uh, during my second year uh, in medical school. I did um, neuroscience was my favorite topic. I did excellent uh, in my what they call shelf exams uh, was the top in our, our in our class. And I have to give credit to my father-in-law, who is a neurologist, who always quizzed me and, and kept me um, on my toes around uh, Thanksgiving dinners and, and, and such. So I, I, I really had, um, uh, I built an interest in neurology. During my third year, or the, actually the last of my second year, I started tutoring uh, neuroanatomy. And I started getting paid for it. So it was a great source of income and just became really uh, I, almost like an expert in neuroanatomy around my school. So that led to my third year and fourth year when I did clinical rotations in uh, neurocritical care, in stroke units, outpatient neurology, and just fell in love with the pathology, uh, treatment modalities, and the um, adverse uh, and, and, and the significant changes and improvement in uh, neurological conditions over the years uh, and, and the, the amount of medications and therapeutic interventions, you're just, you know, this is a growing field that is going to just take off and continue to take off. So um, that uh, allowed me to dedicate myself and make sure that neurology is what I, a neurologist is what I wanted to become. The ideal candidate for neurology would be someone who is extremely patient, someone that has the time to listen to these patients. We're talking about patients with neurodegenerative conditions that um, lead to long-term disability. We're talking about meeting with families that to, to inform them that their loved one has, um, you know, a brain injury and that will result in significant disability. So um, an excellent, compassionate um, person uh, is the ideal candidate. From the academic perspective, doing research in neuroanatomy uh, or even uh, some clinical research in neurology uh, is an advantage uh, to s obtain residency in many residency programs. That's other than step scores, um, a lot of program directors really like uh, to question and learn more about certain research that some students are able to do. And from over the years during residency, I've learned that I've missed that opportunity. And actually, I was lucky enough to be able to attain a residency program. But really, these medical students are now researching in multiple sclerosis at different fields of neurology earlier on. So in order to keep up with that, you've got to do some clinical research. And it doesn't have to be in a lab. It could be uh, a literature review, could be case reports. Um, be active, and there are many, many universities out there that are looking for students and and um, especially uh, international medical grads that are willing to put in some time in doing research uh, to help expand um, uh, their research in, in their universities. Uh, so uh, that's that's really important. And step scores, of course, you got to have a, a, a good uh, step score, I always say you want at least a, a step score above uh, 215, 220. It's always changing nowadays. But um, from when I was sitting on the um, uh, board of uh, the ranking during my residency, during my fourth year as a chief resident in neurology, I've noticed and sadly that there is a filter. And, and I'm going to say this frankly, guys, there is a filter and there shouldn't be, of course, but there is a filter where, you know, um, program directors are really looking for uh, candidates who scored at least 
215, 230 during my time. We're talking about 2013, 14. Right now, I don't know if it's higher or not, but I'm sure it is. So at least you got to make sure you obtain a, a, an appropriate and high enough score to be included in that filter. Um, the university that, that I graduated from, which is down south in Florida, um, very n big, known university, great program, excellent. I am so blessed to have um, actually completed my residency program there. Uh, and we had over four to 5,000 appli applications every year. We would screen, after adding the filter, approximately 2,000 applications. Guess how many applicants we actually interviewed? Less than 100. Guess how many applicants we actually ranked? Less than 60, because guess what? We only needed four. So it is important to be competitive, um, to get some clinical shadowing as a resident, or, or, or as a, I'm sorry, as a student uh, before your residency, make sure you find that connection. Contact people. I had a, a student, a Canadian student, international medical grad. This is a story just last year. He reached out to me. I don't know how, but reached out to other colleagues. We all agreed. It's not that easy, you know, contact me and say, yeah, sure, come on in. But there's a process. Uh, there's a, a reason to why we would take you um, and, and make us take you. Show us that you're interested in a certain field. So we were able to accept him to rotate with us for a month. He had an agenda. He knew where I graduated from, where both of my colleagues did their fellowship from. He received three letters of application from all three of us in a program that's top 10 neurology program in the United States. He called me last, last uh, spring or late, uh, late um, winter. He matched into that program. He's an international medical grant. He put in the time. He knew how to get to where he wanted to be. And now he's going to be doing his residency in a top 10 residency program um, in the United States, which I wasn't able to do, but I was able to get to my fellowship and complete my fellowship in neurophysiology there. So, so these are things that some of the international medical grads need to do. Um, and one rejection, two rejection, three, 10 rejection, it's okay. You get up, you keep on going, you keep applying and find other ways to excel and be known out there. Be known. One more story that I'd like to share with you. I was a third year, med a third year resident um, in neurology and I met during the residency uh, interview process, I met a 55 year old Iraqi international medical grad physician who was a neurologist in his country came here in 2009 we're talking about 2012 2013 at that time came him into came here in 2009 did all his steps again we're talking about a 55 year old man who had to take all his steps applied to residency in 2011 couldn't make it applied to residency in 2012 couldn't make it applied to residency in 2013 got rejected again he went to mayo clinic did a research for one year. He applied to the residency that he got rejected from, and we accepted him when, during his second round. And guess what? My, I was a chief resident to a neurologist who was trained in another country who was an expert in the field, but unfortunately, he decided to leave the country and come and bring his family here, and he took the path that most of us kind of give up and, and don't want to have to suffer and take that path. So it's doable. Uh, it can be done. Uh, it's, it's definitely uh, some hard work and you have to put in the time, but it, it, it's, it's extremely gratifying at the end. A big part of my career that um, allowed me to become a neurologist pretty much is the move that I made during my first year in preliminary internal medicine in, in Cleveland, Ohio. So 
I didn't accept the position as a PGY1 because I wanted to be as a PGY moving forward to a PGY2 because I wanted to become a neurologist. I, I wanted the, tra the, the prelim year because this is a way to enter neurology. So what I did was is I uh, applied and uh, I had I actually was so lucky that I had access to match a resident that was uh, recommended to me by a family member. So I reviewed the list of neurology programs that accepted international medical grants. And I was able to directly email program directors from that list and ask them for an interview. So how I approached this was, hey, I am a pre, I, I am, you know, a, a, a prelim, a resident at this program. And I only have this preliminary year. I am willing to accept a PGY2 position in your program. And at the same time, I had applied for the match. So I was applying for other preliminary programs or categorical programs in neurology. And I've actually interviewed in four that had said, hey, why are you, why do you want to do another year of prelim of internal medicine when you could find a program that can go directly give you the position for a PGY2 position and you could start there so you don't have to do another year. And I was lucky enough to find the program in Florida through Matcha Resident because they replied to me. Believe it or not, I interviewed on Christmas Eve and had an answer Christmas Day that said, hey, you know what? We have a PGY2 spot for you. You're ready to start July of 2012. So I am uh, extremely grateful for Matcha Resident because it's really helpful. That program accepted 50% IMG. Uh, that program also had DO residents. And I know a lot of my colleagues who use that program and that list to see which schools are not only for IMG, but also DO friendly. So uh, it's, it's very easy to look up a list and have a list available and just email individuals rather than emailing everyone. And you don't know if someone's going to even open up your email. So I thank Metro Resident for that greatly. Uh, there are many challenges in the, in the medical field, in every specialty. Uh, the the challenges in neurology uh, pertain mostly to uh, the diagnoses. Uh, we still continue to have, unfortunately, some medical uh, conditions uh, that are uh, devastating, irreversible, degenerative, and um, a lot of students and uh, candidates, residents, and uh, mostly medical students don't want to go to neurology because of that. However, uh, on the upside, neurology is the only field, for instance, that have conditions with over 15 new treatments within a period of five to six years. Uh, neurology is following the course of other specialties like cardiovascular disease, where now there are procedures, where there are procedures that can reverse someone's severe disability. So, so I know there, there are many conditions like ALS and uh, some part, some um, um, disease, uh, some degrees of uh, multiple scler sclerosis and, and, and dementia, but also the literature is there, uh, the, the research is there, and it's going to continue to advance over the years. Uh, one important point that I also would like to add here is that there isn't a medical field out there that does not require a, not a neurologist's opinion. That's one very positive thing. You have my cardiothoracic surgeons that need us after a uh, open bypass, a heart bypass, uh, and, and a patient now is having some neurological symptoms. Uh, there are my neurosurgeons who uh, require us to do certain procedures to diagnose a certain nerve root impingement or a seizure syndrome where they need some further testing to exactly figure out where in the brain is this uh, seizure focus coming from in order to pay, for the patient to undergo surgery. So that's one part of neurology that's extremely um, uh, enjoyable and gratifying and, and, and very useful in that we can really 
give advice in different fields. I mean, I'm constantly being called for uh, hospital admissions of patients with dizziness and things that really can be figured out by other specialists, but they need confirmation from a neurologist. During the application process, it's an extremely uh, complicated and um, very long uh, task that everyone has to really focus on. There are many documents. Uh, there are uh, many little applications uh, and things to, to get through in order to uh, achieve and, and have a really uh, good fit uh, and, and, and comprehensive um, application throughout the process. Letters of recommendations are amongst the most important uh, documentation to have as part of the application. Candidates need to um, make sure to include why are you applying to my residency program, for instance? Why are you going to be a better candidate than the other remaining two, three hundred candidates that we've accepted, not the thousands that we have excluded. So a personal story would be the best thing to include in a letter of recommendation. Uh, how, uh, how personal you want to be? I've read an, a, an application that talked about a candidate and their actually struggle as a child due to an abusive father um, the lack of a mother and his way of actually raising his siblings and fighting to go through the process of taking exams and MCATs and applications. So it could be as personal as you want it to be because guess what? You've made it this far. You've done the right thing. So don't be shy to share something um, uh, personal with these um, directors. Now, I also think a CV is an important, a very important document because before the um, letter of recommendation, it's easier to read a CV and say, this is, I'd like to give a few more minutes to read this person's letter of recommendation. So having a very clean um, CV with the appropriate dates to make sure there are no gaps in between, making sure to include community services, uh, languages, things like that are a plus uh, throughout the application. I go back and emphasize the importance in your STEP scores and obtaining your step, uh, step one, two uh, CKCS, as well as if you feel confident taking your step three, and I'll tell you why. Taking step three in this whole process will definitely make you a better candidate, especially if you pass with a, great, with a good score, than other people that haven't even taken step three. Are we going to have a, a, a resident that's going to start with us, and after their first year, they can't pass step three? That's a problem. Delay in graduation, uh, 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 you know, retaining or, or to given time off during residency so they can study for the steps. So, so taking step three is definitely a huge advantage. Uh, so I, I think if you uh, have your steps, have a, a letter of recommendation and a CV that is different um, than your typical uh, letter of recommendations with some more personable information um, would be a, a, an advantage for uh, uh, the, the perfect candidate for, for these program directors. Along the way, you will uh, experience hardships throughout this whole process. Um, you will uh, be rejected and, and um, sometimes not even get the opportunity to show yourself. So it's best to make sure um, someone else is looking over these documents because the last thing you need is a small error uh, a grammatic error or, or, or something that will uh, prevent you from actually uh, receiving that interview just because uh, something's so silly. Make sure uh, it's okay to spend a little money to have someone else read it, professional services uh, that are out there. Make sure, make sure everyone uh, utilizes them as much as possible. This is, again, a life-saving um, opportunity. So it's important to perfectionist, make it as perfect as possible. Um, 
I, to, to give you further information and uh, words of wisdom, I'm, I just turned 34 years old. I started my residency program at age 24. I did four years of residency, one year of fellowship. I started my job as an attending at age 29. I think probably the youngest attending in my hospital. You're going to feel scared. There's, you're going to learn every single day. But the most important thing is you're going to look back and say, I've put in the work and I deserve this and you move on. So you have to have a, 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 a a patient mind and, and an open mindedness to, to stay calm and continue the journey as hard as it can be, because it is, it is worth it at the end. It's definitely worth it at the end. So lots of um, uh, participate in some research opportunities during your medical school. Um, if you're an international medical grad outside the country, make sure you have all your visas, make sure all your other things that I have no idea about, all of that, that will prevent you from being that second person and allowing a third person to take over your position. Make sure that doesn't happen to you. And make sure all your documents are complete and error free uh, to be the perfect uh, candidate um, that, that the program directors will um, will uh, choose. During the interview process, uh, during the residency interview process, it is important, basic, to follow the basic things. Look clean, look sharp, be early, and have a smile on your face. Everyone there is nervous. It's not just you. Try to participate in conversations because what they're assessing you for, especially if you're an international medical grad, I remember my pro program director actually sat down with me alone and said, oh, you know, for a young guy, you're, you're, you've, got, you've got some good fluency there. All right, yo, you've got some experience. So, so make sure you try to impress as much as possible. You're not showing off. You're just letting people know that you have skills and you could help their program and be a team player in advancing their program in research in participating with education. It is so important to be able to tell program directors that, hey, I love teaching. I love giving lectures to nurses and other residents from other programs. Because when you're a resident, some residents are like, oh, no, you know, I don't have time for this or I'm busy seeing patients. But no, you put in the time and say, I have plenty of PowerPoint talks about this topic that I'd like to uh, uh, screen by you as my program director and try to educate our hospital about a certain topic. Or what I, what really st stood out once is we were interviewing a candidate for neurology and he had a mission to find out why patients with stroke come in with hypokalemia. Look how detailed that was. I mean, this is just a medical student who wanted to go deep into this topic and figure out some research. So that was a research project that he wants to work on when he joins our program and he was willing to put in the time. So uh, these are things uh, that, that, that can be done and said to impress uh, the interviewees.